The first time I really encountered self-reflection was when I was an undergraduate student. I was studying liberal arts, fictions, literatures, and philosophy. Good teachers led me to spaces where I understood that characters were merely symbols for cultural, political, and social ideologies. Those characters were microcosms to a vaster social macrocosm. Great teachers led me to understanding that characters were symbols for me. The characters I disliked, the ones whose books I couldn't wait to end, the characters I despised and cried about, were the ones who shared my shadows and also my griefs. The characters I loved, the ones who I heralded, who I wanted to be like, they shared my attributes, my goals, and sometimes even my conquests. It's unfortunate today students aren't really studying liberal arts as often. They're going into technical and technological fields and business fields because they think those disciplines are going to bring them more money, more fulfillment. They have a career track after four years, and they know that at some level, they're able to control the outcome of their four-year degree. Now, professors are challenged by this, predominantly because they know that when such students come to their classes, those students aren't going to be as interested in going deeply. They want writing skills. They might need to learn deconstructive skills. They may not have the ability to really sit with themselves and look at their social faces. And this, to those professors who have studied symbology and the internal world their whole lives, are finding it challenging to really stick with their educational ethos. We've wrongly equated degrees with conscious awareness. And unfortunately, it seems this could be impacting our daily lives. It's no wonder then in the work world, college educated adults are reticent to look at themselves. They haven't been trained to do so. And ultimately when they get those salaries, when they get the bonuses, when they get the vacation time, they feel like they've accomplished something. Their four years of hard work and all of the work that they've put into the years of their studies pleases their boss, pleases their wives, and they're able to move forward thinking, I've achieved, I'm a success. Is this really the case? I'm not so sure. I think many of those individuals come to crises at some point. They either change careers or they leave their relationship or they start a new enterprise because they think that these outside pursuits are what going to help them get to some deeper level. What they're not realizing is that they're failing to see the beauty of the moment by looking at themselves, by really owning who they are but they weren't trained to do so. They weren't trained to reflect. Philosophers for thousands of years have worried about this. Plato, 2300 years ago, knew this was the case in the human condition. Homer's plays were on the stage. People were becoming entranced with the idea of a chorus. Plays, art, poetry, entertainment, simple stories that could somehow lead them to being distracted from the truth of who they were. Plato feared this was gonna be the end of the Greek empire. He knew that democracy, in order for it to really work, people had to be reflective. They couldn't depend on politicians. They couldn't depend on celebrity. They couldn't depend on the outside world for their own personal validations. They had to learn the difference between art and beauty. Art is the desire for recognition. It's our need to be, be validated. Beauty is honoring ourselves in the moment. It's looking at our beliefs, our motivations, and our fears, and saying, I don't know what's going on, but I need to know that ultimately, I'm okay because I can look at this. In other words, beauty is being meditative. It's interesting, we really think we're meditative. 
We're trying to be. If we go out into culture, we see people who are doing yoga. They're eating healthier. But it's not really taking them to those deep spaces of personal awareness because they're not going into the philosophy. They're just going through the motions. Maybe they're even going for socializing. Plato would have told us that the observer in us would want to be able to know ourselves. We wouldn't necessarily need to say things like it is what it is if we had come to a true surrender, if we had really honored the fact that we felt out of control and we didn't know what would happen and we had to let go. We wouldn't say things like, we need to think outside the box, because we would have broken down the box and recycled it a long time ago, realizing that those beliefs were created by previous generations who didn't know actually the true story of themselves either. The philosopher would know that we're all interconnected and that ultimately the stage, the screen, the life that we're living where we're posting selfies and our dinners and our personal relationships are not truly fulfilling nor intimate. The philosopher knows that the outside world is merely perception. By not focusing on the inside, we're missing out on opportunities to change our lives. We're giving too much power to a world that is merely collective, perceptive illusion. We're thinking politicians are going to keep us from these moments of poverty. We think that celebrities will enable us to feel a real sense of self-worth if they tweet back to us. But ultimately, those moments will lead us to feeling unfulfilled, just like the salary, just like the bonuses. We have to tell the artist in ourselves that your surface, your plot, it's not about the setting, it's not about the characters in my life. It's not about the catalysts that come from the external world. I'm having an internal crisis, and I need to look at it. And if I look at it, and I take action toward moving and changing, my whole world will change. People say to me, OK, Carolyn, how do I do this? I tell them it's a very simple process that takes a lifetime to perfect. Every time you have an emotional moment where you're brought to grief, sadness, fear, worry, this is a teaching moment. You have your own personal teacher with you. It's yourself. It's in those moments that that discomfort is telling you that you have an attachment to an outcome. And if you don't look at it, you're resisting your body's awareness that truth is available to you in you. Now, in those moments, it's very difficult to get out of sadness or grief. You, you have to let it loose. There, there's no stopping this. And when you do that, when you allow that effulgence of anger or sadness to come up, you're doing yourself a favor. Sit with yourself. Be alone. Avoid reacting, avoid posting, avoid displacing. The external world is not going to validate you. And then, after a few minutes, hours, maybe even days, you'll be able to step back when the emotion dissipates. It's then that you can become the philosopher. You were the artist when you were uncomfortable. Now, you're the philosopher. Because the philosopher can look at that moment and say, what was my problem? Was I expecting something from a situation that I actually have to provide for myself? Was I expecting that my friend or my counterpart or the situation or my government or my boss were not providing for me in a way that I felt was appropriate? The outside world is never going to provide for you. It will always come up short even if it gives you a lot of resources and time. Instead, what you have to know is that you need to fulfill your own expectations. You need to provide for yourself. The other way of looking at this is that maybe you have a history or a pattern of feeling unworthy. Perhaps at some previous point in your life, you felt less than. 
And in that moment with that person who brought up that grief, that anger, that fear, that sadness, or that worry, you're reliving that moment. You cannot have a memory without an attachment, without an emotional attachment. And so when you step back and you see, wow, this is a pattern. I get a headache or a backache or a stomach ache when I get angry at my boss. Your boss isn't the cause of your stomach ache. The belief system, the story you've told yourself all along about your unworthiness is actually the issue. And when you can begin to unravel and deconstruct that like you would any hero in a story, you'll begin to realize that this story is not valid. It's something you've assumed from someone else. Ultimately, after years of doing this, you're going to realize that you have a lot less issues, that you like your life in a way that's simpler than you anticipated. You have gratitude for things that are about you, not the external world. You're no longer needing to post a gratitude list and get likes. You're no longer needing to worry about whether or not your boss likes you. You're coming to a new space a space where you say, I own me, I know me, and you can look in the mirror and honor yourself and maybe even come to loving yourself. And it's then that your relationships, your pursuits will begin to have passion. You know what's amazing is that the greatest characters in our stories, in our historical visions, were meditators. They were philosophers. Thousands of years ago, Jesus, Buddha, the people who are heralded by our cultures, went into the literal and metaphorical deserts of their lives and looked at themselves. They didn't set out to create a revolution. The revolution happened because they revolutionized themselves, and they understood that their shadows were their own. Moreover, in the 20th century, if we look at people who made lasting changes in republics, Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, these individuals went into the literal and metaphorical prisons of their lives and looked at themselves. And after many years of meditation, after really owning who they were, they were able to create changes in the external world because they were able to guide others from a place where they had been before themselves. That is empathy. That is compassion. That is what makes lasting change. Reflection. Imagine what would happen to your life if you did this. Simple practice. Whenever you got worked up. Imagine if 7.5 billion people did this we would have revolutions from the inside out. We wouldn't be relying on political figures, celebrities, those we see in the news to transform our stories. We would be rewriting them, editing them, living into them. Life would become the meditation. You wouldn't have to go and sit and ohm for an hour. Imagine what would happen if we became the authors of our own stories. Thank you.